We have exclusive behind the scenes footage from Echo's monumental championship run, including the secret strategies that set new world records and secured $120,000 in the most intense weekend of Mythic Plus WoW has ever seen. So today, we're going to look at all six dungeons from the Great Push Global Finals, including the record setting Halls and Fusion and Freehold. We will also show you two strategies that were actually banned in the tournament, but are still allowed in normal play. Some of the tricks you will see are actually pug friendly that you can use today, whether it's in a plus 15 or a plus 25. And of course, there will also be some very risky strats that you probably shouldn't try at home. Before looking at the two world records, let's dive into Brackenhide where Echo showcased some flashy tech. First was a small trick you might already know. Here, you can see the tank and healer actually swim underneath the starting bubble, which means getting a few seconds of free time to pull the first few packs and pre-position them perfectly for huge AoE damage. Later on, we would see one of the most interesting plays from the weekend, when the evoker runs on top of this pull, rescuing his priest to the same position, who then life grips the mage so that all three DPS now have the high ground. While they're up here, the infected lashers will be unable to hit them with the deadly bleeding debuff and in turn, the only players that will get blood are the Druid and Paladin, who are still positioned below, but won't receive more debuffs than usual during this time. We would see the same tech used on the next pulls, this time using the cave to once again get the high ground and avoid the Lasher bleed. This would again require some precise movement and jumping, but not nearly as much as our next trick, where Echo will do the same thing, this time using a small branch that can only be accessed with our Evoker's Glide which he will then use to rescue the priest to the same position. It might be possible for a hunter, balanced druid, or maybe even a goblin to get here, so the last trick is a bit more challenging to pull off due to the required jump. Shortly after, to save some time on tree mouth, Echo used a fairly common strategy, where a player with an immunity runs into the end of grasping vines to prevent the boss from enraging. In this case, our mage gets consumed, but then immediately ice blocks, canceling the effect, removing the shield, and preventing the enrage. Towards the end of the fight, Echo actually allowed the Grasping Vines cast to finish with nobody in the radius, which actually enrages the boss, but skips the consuming mechanic entirely, and this means that they don't have to worry about the time loss from needing to break the shield. This was a calculated risk later on in the fight, since the enrage only affects how much damage the boss deals to the tank, and since they have almost every CD, there is almost no risk of dying. Next up, we have the 31 Freehold, which was one of the two world records set by Echo over the championship weekend. The start of the run saw some pretty standard tech. Key mobs include the Iron Tide Enforcers, who cast a nasty shattering bellow on the entire goop for massive AoE damage. This first hit is survived without any issue because Echo simply traded out personal defensives. Later on in the pull, when defenses are down, you can see both the Mage and Shadow Priest run off the screen and by doing so, they are able to completely outrange the AoE blast due to its limited 30-yard radius. Meanwhile, our Evoker and Paladin duck for cover behind this tree stump, which also negates the damage entirely by using Line of Sight. This world record freehold would also include two skips. The first was here to avoid this inefficient enforcer guarding the bridge immediately after Captain Crag. Our Evoker can rescue multiple players as long as the main target is in a passenger mount, which they do onto the middle of the bridge, skipping the Enforcer entirely. We will see something similar much later on, but before we get into it, we have two back-to-back -back tricks immediately after the second boss. Here, you can see our mage making his way towards the Ring of Booty to start the RP event in advance, since it takes almost a minute to even finish. And while he's doing that, you can see that our Evoker, Priest, and Paladin position on top of this awning while our tank starts a massive pull. This is one of the few dungeons where our Evoker can make use of Warnstone, which our mage uses to teleport back to our group after finishing the RP event. Meanwhile, our tank is still off in the distance, continuing the pull. This awning positioning was inspired by North American teams and the qualifying cups, and allows the players above to avoid multiple mechanics, including the dashes from the duelists, rat traps from the trappers, and the sea sprouts from the oarsmen. Instead, these abilities will spawn on the ground underneath the players, essentially removing these mechanics from our ranged DPS, and instead transferring most of the pressure onto the tank and healer, who burn multiple defensives to survive the onslaught of damage. This, however, is definitely not a pull you would want to try in bugs, for obvious reasons. Finally, towards the end of the dungeon, we would see our last mount skip, once again with our evoker rescuing players in a passenger mount in order to bypass some trash leading up to the final boss. Now, let's dive into Halls of Infusion and learn the tricks Echo used to secure a new world record with a plus 30 key. The start of the run included a trick borrowed from teams playing on Taiwanese servers, 
utilizing these benches along the circular walkways, which prevents players from getting hit by the Geomancer's seismic slam. Now, since this was volcanic and our evoker needed to help out with mob control and breath of eons, you can see him leave the safety of the bench, while our Shadow Priest continues to stand there, channeling out big damage. If you don't have much mob control to contribute on these pulls and are playing a ranged DPS, it is probably safe to stand up top. Towards the end of the run, we would see some smart positioning play against the mini boss and the infusion chamber. Infuser Saria periodically casts an Indate, which deals massive damage to everyone within a 40 yard radius. To avoid this, our evoker uses a range tracker to get out of the blast zone before the inundate cast finishes, and this entire time, both the mage and the shadow priest are able to max range the spell easily since their spells aren't limited to 25 yards. Of course, our evoker will need to push back into the mini boss and assist with damage and interrupts, and instead of outranging the next cast, he will simply rescue his paladin to make sure both players have some damage reduction for the upcoming hit. Before we move on to the next dungeon, we have one additional high level strategy that wasn't easy to see on the official broadcast. It's pretty common to see high rated teams pull every single infuser at once, using kicks and knocks to group all four mobs in the middle of the room for maximum damage. What is harder to notice is the precision involved in making sure each mob dies at the right time. And here, you can see the group slow down on damage slightly to ensure that they enter the boss phase with every offensive cooldown ready. Again, this might seem minor, but it's a perfect example of the team play needed to push the highest keys. Sometimes, it's best to slow down on damage to make sure you have cooldowns ready for the pressure points that truly matter. With two world records under their belt, we move on to Vortex Pinnacle, where we saw some more borrowed tech from North America. The plus 29 included a common tactic used by MDI teams, which allowed them to pull way more assassins than normal. These mobs will teleport to random players and immediately inflict damage, which is obviously a problem when pulling such a large amount. But by standing underneath the ramp, our 3 DPS are able to avoid the damage entirely, and are still in a position to interrupt as needed. Once again, this was a common tactic seen by most teams over the weekend, including Perplexed in the top right corner using the exact same positioning. For most key levels, this strategy isn't necessary, but is a neat trick nonetheless. Speaking of neat tricks, Echo employed more borrowed tech, this time using Dominant Mind towards the end of the dungeon. Here you can see our Shadow Priest running off screen while our group takes down the Skyfall Stars. Taking a look at their point of view, Dominant Mind will be cast on the Temple Adept, which is a pretty common strategy. Now normally, when a mob is MC'd, surrounding NPCs will have aggro on the Priest, but in this case, the Trash just beats their Adept body to death and then ignores the Shadow Priest entirely, allowing the rest of the group to kill off the Stars before our Priest runs back to help. This allowed Echo to save a few seconds, and even gives them an opportunity to do a big pull with one less adept to deal with. Next up, we have the Underrod, where Echo employed an old MDI strategy all the way back from BFA. Here, our group is facing off against the third boss, Spore Caller Zonsha, and normally, groups have to clear the mushrooms around the room by baiting two different mechanics, and if that doesn't happen, then once the boss counts Festering Harvest, everyone will instantly get multiple stacks of a disease called Decaying Spores, which will cause unhealable damage. Notice here though that the boss is casting Festering Harvest, and if we look in the background, no mushrooms have been cleared, so what is Echo doing? Let's play and quickly pause. Here our Druid, Evoker, and Shadow Priest have 40 stacks of the disease, while our Paladin pre-bubbled the hit and our Mage pre-blocked. Now don't blink because in just a moment our Druid will get dispelled by our Paladin, while our Priest stone forms their own debuffs after dispelling our Evoker. And just like that, our group is cleared of the massive debuff instantly, where they can now resume the fight as normal. Finally, let's wrap up in Oldaman, where we will learn about the two strategies that were actually banned in the tournament. And just to be abundantly clear, Echo did not use either one of these strats, despite the fact that many groups on live servers might be doing so as we speak. On the second boss, it's possible to avoid some of the mechanics by standing on the tent in the north side of the room. This is something we actually showcased before in our M Plus Mechanics video a month ago, so if you haven't seen it already, be sure to check it out. Once again, this trick was not used by any team in the tournament simply because it was not allowed and might be instantly disqualifying. The second ban strategy was on the final boss and involved a trick using LOS. If we pause, you can see that there are two pillars at the end of the room, which have a small space behind them that acts as a line of sight. The reason this matters is because of the boss's wing buffet mechanic. This spell deals huge group-wide AoE damage, but can actually be line of sighted using the pillars from before. Once again, no team in the tournament used the strategy, but it's probably something that can be safely employed in any pug groups. The remainder of the old man was pretty typical for every team, including Echo. But we want to hear from you. What was the craziest strategy you saw in last weekend's TGP finals? Was there something we missed? Let us know in the comments below.
And while you're doing that, be sure to subscribe to our channel in case you want to see more high-level Mythic Plus content. We're currently working alongside some of the best players in the world to develop high-quality guides for M+. So with that in mind, what topics would you like us to cover next? Do you have any specific pain points you would like help with? Let us know in the comments below. As always though, we want to thank everyone for watching. See you soon.